So let's take a look at how we do homework number one. Homework number one is all about perception of color and it's going to give you a chance to work through perception of a particular wavelength of light using first trichromatic theory and then opponent process theory. So we're going to start off with trichromatic theory and here the instructions say to describe in a step-by-step -step way how a light with a wavelength of 535 nanometers is processed according to first trichromatic theory and then opponent process theory. For trichromatic theory describe how strongly the short, medium, and long cones would react. So we're going to use percentages for that. So we'll start off with trichromatic theory. Trichromatic theory states that there are three mechanisms for sensing and perceiving colors. These three mechanisms are the three types of cones. Each type of cone responds to a different range of wavelengths. And that's what we're seeing down here in this picture. We're seeing the range of wavelengths that the short wavelength cone over here designated as blue reacts to. So it reacts to everything from 400 to a little bit here at 550. And then the next one is the medium wavelength cone specializes in seeing the color green, right? And that has a very broad range from, you know, about 425 or so to a little bit over 650 here. And then the third one is the long wavelength cone. We see it here. And that one specializes in these longer wavelengths from about um, 450, 460, all the way up through about 700, the far end of our range over here. So each of these cones has a different makeup in its proteins, allowing it to absorb only a range of wavelengths, not the entire vis visible spectrum. So trichromatic theory says that for every color in the rainbow, there is a unique pattern of activity among the three cones. And so that's what we're going to look at. I'm not going to do 535 nanometers because that's the homework, um, but I'm going to do uh, an example here with 650 nanometers instead. And so we're going to use this as our example for the homework activity. Uh, you'll do 535, which would be around here. Okay. So not quite in the middle, a little bit to the right between 500 and 550. And for our example right now for 650, we want to see how the cones are going to react to this light. So I'm going to start by going to where 650 is and I'm going to just draw a vertical line here. And I'm going to focus on where my vertical line intersects the curves, these sh uh, shapes here that represent the strength of the activity of each of our cones. So let's take a moment and look over here at our y-axis, okay? So our, our y-axis here is says absorption in arbitrary units. Let's just use percentage. And we can say that down here at the very bottom, we are at 0%, and down here at the very top, we are at 100%. So really what it's just showing us is that for all the different wavelengths of light from 400 to 700, this is how strong the reaction would be. The reaction would, if it's up here at the very top, then it's at maximum, 100% maximum. And if it's all the way at the bottom down here, then it'd be at zero, no reaction at all, right? And so that's what we're looking at. And so we can ask ourselves, okay, so how do these cones react to this wavelength of light, this uh, wavelength of light that is 650 nanometers in length? And we want to do that for the short cone, the medium cone, and the long cone, blue, green, and red. So the short cone is way over here. There's no activity at all for 650 nanometers, so that one's gonna be zero. The medium cone, let's see where that one intersects. So right here, okay, so here's 650, I go up, I run into the, the curve here, showing the response for the medium wavelength cone, and it intersects at this point. Now to figure out how strong that reaction is, I want to see where that is on my y-axis here. 
So I'm just going to kind of, you know, represent that by going across and seeing where I am here. So on this scale, 50 would be here. You know, this might be 15 or 20 percent. Now let's see the reaction of the long wavelength cone. I'm going to keep going up. I run into the curve for the long wavelength cone here. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to see where is this point on the y-axis. And so I see that it's over here. And so that's pretty close to 50. We can call it 50. We can call it 45%, somewhere in there. And so here, I have the reaction or the response of the short cone, the medium cone, and the long cone. I'm using percentages. And we can see that for a 650 nanometer wavelength light, the strongest reaction is by the long wavelength cones. There's a weak reaction by the medium wavelength cones and no reaction by the short wavelength cones. So according to trichromatic theory, we have these three cones, short, medium and long wavelength cones, each specializing in a different range of wavelengths. And this is the pattern of activity across the three cones. This unique pattern then is interpreted by the brain as red, but we're not really ready for that yet. We haven't gotten to that interpretation yet because there's another step in color perception. And that is opponent process theory. So to get to perception of the color red, we need to incorporate the next step. And that next step is that there are neurons in the retina that respond one way to one color and a different way to another color. So these are ganglion cells in the retina. They will become excited or inhibited depending on the input received from the cones. So there are two different color-based opponent process systems. There's a red-green system or channel. And then there's the yellow-blue channel. There's a third one that's black and white, but we won't talk about that one. That one's achromatic, right? So the red green channel, focus on that one first. That one's a little bit simpler. This is a ganglion cell, a single ganglion cell. And think of it as it being hooked up to a set of cones one of the cones is going to be a long wavelength cone and the other cone is going to be a medium wavelength cone. And so it's receiving these inputs. Now the way this is going to work is that the long cone might stimulate it or excite it. The medium cone might inhibit it. This is not set in stone. Some cases you'll see a long cone be inhibitory, and in other cases you see the long cone be excitatory. In other words, these can switch around. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that this ganglion cell here gets activated by one and inhibited by the other. If we look at our pattern of activity here and we compare the medium and the long cone, in this case, which one is more active? Well, the long cone, right? So this ganglion cell is going to get more excitation from the long cone than it's receiving inhibition from the medium cone. Think of it as an arm wrestle. And long cone is more active, so it's going to beat the medium cone. It's going to win this contest. And as a result, then this ganglion cell is going to signal red. And it'll do that by becoming excited. Now let's see how this process would work if instead of the color being red, maybe it was green. 
So if we look at our spectrum here, green would be about, oh, um, home, your homework assignment is for 535. I'll do a slightly different color. So maybe 515. Uh, and that wavelength, would, we're just going to say, is usually perceived as green. And so trichromatic theory is going to explain the reaction of the three types of cones. And so we're going to have our short, medium, and long cones. And so for a color that's roughly, um, you know, here, we're going to see a pattern of, let's go up here, there we go, some mix of short cone, medium cone, and then the long cone. And so the short is active at about, oh, 45%. We'll say that the long is also active at about 45%, but the medium is active at like 90% way up here. Short, 45%, long, 45%, but the medium is like 90%. And so this information is gonna to go to our ganglion cell and the long cone is here, medium cone is here, And we said last time that in this particular neuron, the long cone excites and the medium cone inhibits. So let's designate that with pluses and minus. Who's going to win this arm wrestling match? In this case, the medium cone is going to win it. It's more active than the long cone, right? So because the medium is at 90%, the long is only at 45%. It's going to win out and then the ganglion cell is going to signal um, by becoming inhibited. And that tells the other neurons that are receiving this information that the wavelength is going to be interpreted as green. And so the ganglion cell, it's flipping a switch from one to the other depending on which of these two cones is more active. If the long cone is more active, it's flips the switch to red. If the medium cone is more active, it flips the switch to green. The other opponent process channel is the one for blue and yellow. So that one flips the switch for blue or yellow, decides between those two colors. So a color can only be one or the other. And it compares input from the short cone versus the combined activity of the medium and long cone. If we have our ganglion cell here, it's going to compare the short cone, which maybe we can say provides stimulation or excitation, with the combined activity of the medium and long cones together. And maybe those will provide inhibition. And it's the same sort of competition or arm wrestle, right? If the short cone is more active, then the color will be perceived as blue. If the short cone is more active, the color is perceived as blue because there's greater excitation from the short cone than inhibition from the medium and long cones. However, if the medium and long cones are more active, then our ganglion cell will become inhibited. And in doing so, it signals that the color is yellow. The second part of this question asks us to compare the color perceived by a person with normal color vision when receiving light of 492 nanometers with the color perceived by a person missing the long wavelength cone. And so here we have this figure which is in our lecture slides and it shows 
what a person who is missing the long cone, a pure protonope, medium cone, or short cone would see to light of a variety of wavelengths. So from our, our whole visible spectrum from 400 to 700, closer to 400, they would see something like this, and then closer to 700, see something like this. Notice the absence of, say, red here with a person who's missing the long wavelength cone. Remember, the long cone can also be called the red cone because it specializes in that longer wavelength area that we end up perceiving as red. And so what's special here about 492? 492 is an area in here, and I know in the picture it does kind of look greenish maybe, if you do have, you know, typical color vision, but let's just say that it's kind of indistinguishable. <laughs> We're going to just call it kind of a grayish color. This point here, where the wavelengths are 492, that is often called the neutral point. And to figure out what that means, we have to go back to this picture we were looking at earlier, here. And so in this picture, we can see that 492 would be right around, oh, 450, 60, 70, 80, 90 maybe, probably be right around here. So 492 is right around there, and not coincidentally, it corresponds with this point right here, where we see an X, right? This X here is the intersection of the responses of the short and the medium cone, and it's where they are both equally active. Now, in a person with normal or typical color vision, this color would look sort of bluish green. And like every other wavelength along the spectrum, there would be a unique pattern of activity across the short, medium, and long wavelength cones. Short would be at whatever percentage this is, so maybe 60%. And the medium cone would be at 60%. And then the long wavelength cone would be down here at like, you know, 25% or something or 15%. And that unique combination would be perceived as this sort of blue green color. But how about if a person doesn't have this long wavelength cone? They only have a short cone and a medium cone. Now we have a wavelength that creates equal activity in the short and medium cones. Now, there are certain times that that happens, white, gray, and black. Any, color, any wavelength of light that has an equal distribution of wavelengths, in other words, there's no, it's not just 450 or it's not a, a mix of, of wavelengths, but a majority of any one of these numbers, all of these wavelengths of light are equally represented. That's what we call white light. If there's a lot of white light, it's white. If there's just a little bit, it appears gray. And if there's very little, it'll appear dark or black. What the brain does is it looks at this equal activity in the short and medium cones in this individual to 492 wavelength light and draws the only conclusion it normally can, it can when there are two cones that are producing the same amount of activity. All the cones that this individual has are producing the same amount of activity. So they're gonna interpret, the brain is gonna interpret that as some shade of gray or white or black. Cause that's normally the only thing that can do that. And again, that's just an artifact of this individual missing the long wavelength cone, which would be like the tiebreaker. So that's what happens in color vision deficiency. 